Psalm 67. This psalm is used as a canticle at evening prayer instead of the Nunc Dimittis in the Anglican Church. It's called the Deus Miseriato. This psalm is a hymn of praise which emphasizes divine grace. The last two verses connect the hymn to harvest, but some say that this is actually an addition for a special occasion and originally was not intended to be there uh, when the psalmist wrote the psalm. Verses 6 and 7 are an addendum to the original, so the belief is that verses 3 and 5 were actually the, the end of the psalm. Well, verse 5 anyway. Let's have a look at the title as we have with most of these psalms. The title is To the Chief Musician, and again, On the Strings, as it was in Psalm 61. Perhaps that means the, the leader of the harps. Again, there's two interesting things about this psalm. The first is that in the psalm, as opposed to Psalm 66, this psalm reverses the introduction and it says instead of song or psalm, in this particular psalm it says a psalm or song. And nobody quite knows why they've done that. The other anomaly is that the author's name doesn't appear anywhere. And this is noted as a peculiarity by some of the commentators. So basically, we're not quite sure who conducts the choir, the harps. We're not quite sure why they put a psalm or a song and we don't really know who it was written by. But apart from that, we, we're really very knowledgeable. Verse 1. This is an introduction, or an adaptation, sorry, of the Aaronic blessing, which you'll find in Numbers 6, verses 24 to 26. And a very familiar blessing to anyone who regularly attends church. Verse 2 harks back to a much earlier blessing, however, and that's the Abrahamic blessing, which you can find in Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3. The Aaronic blessing is really a blessing for Israel, the people of God. And during the Exodus period, this was a blessing that was very popular amongst God's people. But the Abrahamic blessing, Abraham's blessing, is a blessing to the whole world, all nations, all peoples. And the psalmist really making a point that from Israel's own blessing will flow a wonderful blessing to the rest of the world. Life imparting truth and salvation to the whole earth, to all the nations. We see a very similar progression in 2, 2 Timothy 3.15. Most of us will know 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction and training in righteousness. But if we start at verse 15 and read that passage, it reminds us of the way Scripture imparts not only salvation, but also truth. Verses 3 and 5 are the refrain. The refrain is a prayer of great vision and daring. And it, it adds in the second line the addition of all, emphasising God as the Lord whom every tongue must confess. Some suggest praise should be replaced with give thanks in these verses, so you might want to try it out. Philippians 2 verse 11 reminds us that the word for confess is a word called exomologio, and that word also has the idea of praise within it, just as there are in, in the psalm. So confess and praise have very similar ideas within them. Verse 4. Sing, O nations, because God will judge you with righteousness, integrity and justice. This is the idea that God will lead and guide the Israeli people, a sense of him pastoring them and leading them by his standards of care for all and justice for all. This is picked up in the prayer book of the Church of England, the Book of Common Prayer. It's picked up in the Holy Communion service when we pray for the Queen and also the whole state of Christ Church militant here on earth. And there's a little phrase, that we may be godly and quietly governed by Her Majesty. This reminds us that God expects certain things of us. 
he expects that there will be a, a real sense of quietness and justice and godliness in the way that our land is governed. And, you know, in the 21st century, there's a kindliness which tries to make no moral judgment. And in actual fact, that's as alien to biblical thought as the idea of a tyrant that rules without love. In God's ruling and guiding, there's a marriage of strength and ten tenderness. Have a look at some of the biblical passages. Exodus 34, verse 6 and following. Isaiah 11, verses 1 to 9. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 4. And this psalm says that all nations will give glory to God only when God governs and guides them. And how will that be? Well, it will be because as the nations see a radiant Israel, a radiant people of God, blessed by God, they too will want that same sense of being blessed and being radiant. Verses 6 to 7 remind us of all sorts of important truths. Verse 6a contains the only past tense in the whole of the psalm. The rest is expectation or prayer repeating either God will bless or let God bless us. We can pray, sorry, probably because God is our God. But he's not ours to monopolize. He isn't only ours. And he wants to be not only our God, but he wants to be the God of the whole world. And we know, of course, that one day all nations will bow to God. God may start in these two verses with abundant crops, but the end point of the verses is that God will give greater and grander things than simply abundant crops. In New Testament times, we would say those greater things are actually to do with the gospel, the good news, spreading the good news, which will extend all around the world so that all peoples will bless God, every nation, every people, every culture, God glorified by all nations. This is the great objective of faith, the gathering of the nations. And Jesus reminded the, the people of this in Matthew 9, verses 36 to 38, and John 4, verses 30 to 35. God's blessing will come to all when they allow God to govern and guide them. It is when God's people are alive with joy and praise, lit up by it, that God's ways and his salvation will be known by the people around. There has also to be an authenticity about God's people, their lives reflecting a people who are guided and ruled by the presence of God, the truth of God, and the love of God. The early church was able to evangelize others in its teaching, and its teachings were very powerful, as we read in the letters of Paul. It was able to evangelize in its living. The early part of Acts reminds us of the way in which the attractive new Christian community reached out to others and thousands were converted in a single day. But also in its worship, if you read 1 Corinthians, you will find that the worship of the church, as it is lit up with praise, draws and attracts people to love God. Praise liberates. It sets us free both internally as individuals, but also together, impacting all of those around and generating in them hope and expectation, a sense there is a God who is real, a God who blesses them, a God who will bless them and bless us. The verse says, the earth with its increase. This is a promise of better things to come, maybe even a picture of them, as we see in Isaiah 55, verses 1 and following. And passages such as John 4.35 and John 12.22-24 echo this sense of better things to come. This passage says, Let God, who brings much out of little, and distributes it in love, bring such blessings on us as to make us in our turn a blessing to all the world. So let's summarise what we see in this Psalm 67. 
David discovered a transformational God, a God who changed him and others by his mercy, his blessing, and of course his wonderful presence. There was a purpose to this, that God's ways could be known by all, and his salvation known among all nations. This transformational God could transform not only David, but all peoples, wherever they may be. In owning and praising God, they'd be transformed by joy, and justice would guide and rule all peoples. Looking at our world today, many of us would wish that that would be true in the 21st century. In owning and praising God, all would experience the blessings David himself had received, the blessings associated with God's love and provision. Of course, the psalm also holds out a future hope. The new David, Jesus, also holds out God's blessing to all people and all nations, as they own God's love, as their guiding and ruling principle, so they will discover transformation and blessing. The power of praise is the power of God's transformational presence. And we have all experienced that powerful presence of God, so alive in praise and worship. And David wants all to be blessed by that experience. And as Christians, our prayer also is that God's transformational love, experienced by us in praise, may be experienced by all as they own Christ, the living God, as the Holy Spirit enlightens their inner beings, as they are lit up in praise and worship. This continues to be our prayer, the prayer of the people of God, a prayer for every generation, for every nation, in every age.